Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. Yeah, because I started just started the recording so that you know later on we can share this meeting, you know, with the uh, uh, other group with anyone who are interested in space. So yeah. Um, I cannot hear you. So do you know what happened to all the dinosaurs? So the dinosaurs, uh, the a uh, big meteor crashed at the Earth, killing all the dinosaurs and making them extinct. Yeah. Yeah. So they're 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 all gone, right? They remember um our uh, human, you know. So the modern human, you know, the Homo sapiens, you know, species as we are today, we just you know uh start roaming on the Earth for a very very short period of time, something like you know ten thousand years. I mean, to a human life, is a very long year. But if you look at the history of the Earth, of the planet Earth itself, it is very small. It's like a blink of an eye. 10,000 years is nothing compared to the age of the Earth. And by the way, um, anybody knows about how old is the Earth? How old is our Earth, the planet Earth? Yeah, please. Oh, by the way, this is my little daughter, you know, of Wuha. She's a student from uh, grade four, you know, four F, Maryland. Yeah, happy to see her again here. <laughs> so, anybody has an answer to the question: How old is our planet Earth? Um, Earth is about like approximately four point five billion years old. Oh, where did you learn that? Um, from my encyclopedias, which I have at home. That's a very good answer, you know. 4.5 billion years. Now, if you look at the Earth, it's a very long period of time, okay? And then the human part, you know, we just appear on this Earth for like 10,000 years. It's nothing. So what happened all the history before that? Look at dinosaurs. They started, uh, you know, uh, roaming the earth about 225 million years ago and then after hundreds of millions of years suddenly around 65 million years ago they suddenly disappear all of them you know the t-rex the long neck dinosaur the stegosaurus the flying dinosaur all of the mighty creatures suddenly they disappear and one of the theory one of the theory a scientist still trying to learn about about this is um, you know, for now, all that we can learn about dinosaurs is through the fossil, right? Or the remains, dinosaurs from that time. And then one of the most, um, uh, you know, the, the theory that we believe is, as you mentioned correctly, some of the asteroids, a big one, that somehow it hit the Earth, crashed with the Earth. And then it, it's, it's a, quite a big, you know, asteroid. It created a huge explosion. So think of something like a, a nuclear bomb, you know, or something even more catastrophic, you know, something bigger. So it create a big explosion. Obviously, it killed all of the dinosaurs within nearby, right? However, after the explosion, a lot of material, a lot of dust, you know, and debris got, you know, pumped up into the atmosphere. And it created, you know, a cloud of debris, a cloud of dust fully covering the entire earth and blocking the sun. And this is, that was the main reason why, you know, without the sun, you know that, right? Uh, for all the living things, we need the sun. We need sunlight to provide earth heat and provide earth, you know, the source of energy for us to live. At that time, after that event happened, the earth was covered with, in a very thick cloud of dust. And then it fully covered, blocked the sun. And then all of the dinosaurs, they, they they went extinct. So now the question is to us human, we still consider that you know we are you know smart, we are intelligent, you know. So if history is to be happen again, will we accept the fate of the dinosaurs? Will we accept, you know, if we know that, you know, let's say in 10 years, in 100 years, if something, you know, like a big asteroid is gonna hit the earth, should we accept our fate? Should we accept to, you know, to 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 should we let history to repeat itself again, or should we do something about it? So this brings us to the next question. Um, usually, uh, at the moment, you know, many scientists, you know, many countries, you know, we are investing into space because we are trying to solve 
a lot of questions, but I would like to bring up, you know, three big questions that, you know, uh, space scientists, they are trying to find the answer by looking at space. Uh, question number one, we would like to learn from, the, to look at the past, to know where do we come from? We all know that, you know, life begins, right? Uh, you know, we begin as, you know, uh, we were evolved, the human species, you know, evolved from, you know, chimpanzee, right? From some, you know, intelligent species of the monkey, basically. But what happened long before that? So the monk, the chimpanzee, you know, it evolved some from some other life form. And if you try to trace all the way back, um, scientists still try to understand, to, to find the, the definite answer. Where do we come from? Did we come from the earth itself? Or somehow, somebody else, you know, uh, maybe alien, maybe somebody elsewhere, that they came and they plant something, they, they gave life to earth, or did it come from comet or from somewhere else? So this is a very interesting question because even with nowadays scientists, there's still a lot of questions that even nowadays we could not answer, you know, like, you know, about the UFO, unidentified flying object, right? Are they true? And if you look at the Stonehenge, the picture of Stonehenge and some of the very strange, you know, marking on the earth, it was created by somebody, but definitely it's very difficult for humans, for our ancestors, you know, like thousands of years ago to, to be able to build such such thing. So scientists, we are trying to look to find the answer. So question number one, which want to look at the past to understand our history. And question number two, we would like to learn about the future. Where are we going to? What's What's going to happen with the Earth? Uh, if you look, uh, remember at the animation I'm showing on my screen. This is the um, animation of uh, Pangaea, you know, the surface of the Earth a long time ago. Right? There was only one continent, if you remember. One gigantic continent. and But slowly, slowly, it broke apart into smaller continents, right? And like what we have nowadays, you know, the five continents. But long time ago, there was just only one continent. And remember, the Earth keep changing. The surface of the Earth, you know, the continents start moving, and they start crashing to each other, start moving. So we would like to know the future. In this next video, I'm showing you a video of the Sun. Remember, the Sun is very important. It is the nearest star, and then the Sun gives us energy, right? You know, even imagine with without sunlight, you know, the Earth would be very cold, dark place, and Definitely, there would be no life. But remember, the sun is just not, you know, like 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 a big fireball. It is a very active. We can say it's a living thing. This is the uh, images of the sun. Actually, it's a video of the sun, captured by one of the uh, by Soho. It's one of the satellites specialized in observing the sun. So, in order to be able to study the sun, we block out the central part, which is very bright, so that we can see some activity on the surface of the sun. And if you can see closely, you can see that from time to time, the sun, you know, it emits a lot of like high energetic uh, ray. We call it the CME, you know, corona mass ejection. This is what we call the, the cloud of, you know, high energetic, you know, particle. Sometimes it hits the earth. And these are very dangerous. They are, you know, um, lethal. You know, it, it's, it could kill any living, um, organism. But thanks to the magnetic field of the Earth, if you remember, if you learn about physics, we know that the Earth itself, it has the magnetic field, right? And because of that magnetic field, you can look at this uh, animation, you can see the magnetic field is protecting the Earth from the, you know, uh, ejection of the Sun. Um, but in the future, who knows, something might happen and then uh, we need to, as a human, you know, we want to to be able to learn about those those kind of uh, events, you know, to better prepare ourselves in the future. And let's talk about the, the next big question. This is a very big question. We are talking about life on another planet. So for now, so far we know that, you know, life only exists on Earth. Life as we know, right? So we know, you know, all the human, all the intelligent being. The question is, is there anybody else, uh, you know, out there? You know, maybe in another planet, in another moon. 
is there extraterrestrial intelligence? Is there any anything intelligent out there? Now, if you go out and look at the night sky, we can see million and million and billion of stars. If you look at the Milky Way, there are billion of stars out there. And imagine each of the stars, it is very similar to our very own sun. The sun is just basically one ordinary star among the billion stars. So there should be like many, many planets. We call them exoplanets orbiting those stars, right? If you remember, you know, there are eight planets, you know, it's uh, orbiting the sun. So the same story could happen with other sun out there. Some sun, they might have, you know, a few planets, but some may have a dozen of planets orbiting them. And then among those planets, there might be some planet which is capable of, you know, um, supporting life. And then life may develop. And there might be somebody out there. So this is the big question that scientists are trying to understand. We are building a lot of radio telescope, you know, a lot of big telescope trying to look at the star, to, to study, to learn about the universe. Now, that's a big thing, okay? And uh, let's try to get back closer to home. Let's talk about the solar system, you know, the some of the recent exploration of the solar system. Uh, so next, I'm going to talk about the red planets. We all know about the red planets, right? Uh, so Mars, so why why is it important, you know? Why everybody's talking about Mars? If you look at the space program of the United States, you know, the European Union, of many other countries, China, China, India, Russia, everybody's trying to launch a mission to, to Mars. Next, if you remember, uh, when I started the presentation, I mentioned that, you know, going to space is not easy. And actually, it is quite difficult. Let's have a look at this chart. This chart show all of the missions, space mission, uh, intended to go to explore Mars. So the red one you can see are the uh, the mission from Soviet Union and from Russia. They try to launch to Mars so many times. Okay, um, the blue one you will get you know uh, United States, uh, you know from America, the. Uh, yeah, and then from you know from Japan, from the European Space Agency as well. So, in order to try to get to Mars, a lot of mission, a large number of mission has failed. If you look at the first circle, this circle show the number of mission has failed. You know, either the spacecraft get exploded, you know, it lose contact during launching. Many of them, but that did not stop human. You know, as a human, we we learn from the mistake. You know. Because space is very challenging. We learn from mistakes, from those failures, and they build better and better spacecraft. And then some of the mission success, you know, like uh, Mariner 4 from the, uh, uh, it's an American spacecraft, you know, which was launched to Mars in 1964. It became the first successful spacecraft to fly by Mars. It took a lot of picture, close up picture, and sent back to Earth. And then we, try to go further with, you know, orbital mission, which means spacecraft that flew to Mars and slow down and go into orbits around the red planet to be able to study it for a longer period of time. And then we develop, you know, lander, which could land on the surface of Mars. And then finally rover, you know, where, you know, using uh, wheels, it has some mobility to uh, go around the surface of the red planet to study. And here are some amazing, fascinating picture, you know, that was taken from the planet of Mars. If you look closely, uh, what can you see? Can somebody tell me about what, 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 what did you see? What do you see from those picture? Anyone? Anyone what? from the class? Come, come, come. Come stand here. Because you might what, does, what, what does it look like? Okay, so I see like small cracks on the surface of Mars, which means there might be like uh before there might be like water, uh there might be water on the surface of Mars. Actually, they, these are not cracks. It looks like cracks, right? But actually, these looks like you know the a dry river. You know, if you look at the map of the Earth, you know, those are we call it uh, river delta. You know, where big river basically you have a lot of stream. You know, many smaller stream, right? They flow together and then together they join, they form river. 
and then river is the curve, the curvature of the river when it flow. And this is exactly what is showing on Mars nowadays. However, when scientists look at those pictures, they, they are very they, they were very much surprised. Okay, this looks like river, but where 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 is the water? They don't see any water right now. And all of the river, as we can see on Mars, they are dry. So where so they know that you know in the past, definitely, like a long, long time ago, definitely there is some something I mean, most likely in you know, the water. It could be any other fluid, right? But then water is the most likely you know possible scenario but the question is where where did all the wet water went so we send a lot of uh a rover as i mentioned earlier in order to learn try to find the answer to this question we land uh, a lot of rover you know so here is some animation you can see by the images taken from the rover and then on the right hand side you can see some of the challenges facing the rover you know why they move on the martian surface Sometimes they got stuck in the sand because the Martian, you know, the sometimes you know it's rocky, but there are some parts of uh, Mars it's very sandy, so it, it it is a real challenge, you know, in order to explore and try to learn about the red planet. And here are some very detailed, you know, images taken from the surface of Mars. And when scientists looking at this picture again, they see something very very familiar to what we have on Earth. If you look closely at the rocks, you know, you can see a light, the pattern, right? Many linear, you know, a feature. This is very much exactly the, very similar to the sedimentary rocks, you know, which form during the presence of water, you know, on Earth. So we're sure that, you know, in the past, definitely Mars was much wetter than it is nowadays. And here, this is an um, visualization, you know, of the history of Mars like several billion years ago. If you look now, Mars is completely dry. There is no water at all. But you know, uh, one billion years ago, two billion years, and if you look all the way back in the past, four billion years ago, um, remember, remember uh, Mars has a similar age with the Earth. So the Earth itself, you know, it's about like 4.5 billion years old, right? Mars is like, you know, like younger, you know, uh, brother. It's, a, it's about like 4 billion years old, you know. And then, back then, when the planet was formed, definitely it had a lot of water, even ocean, we're talking about that. But somehow in the past, that water somehow, you know, evaporated or it went underground. This is the big question that uh, scientists are still trying to learn nowadays to figure out. Now, let's go to another planet. Uh, can anybody tell me uh, what is this celestial object? Anyone, please? Does anyone know this picture is an image of which uh, celestial object? It's the moon. How do you know it's the moon? Oh, uh, well, I'm quite when familiar I look at with the night. And the craters there, they... Actually, mm -hmm. Like, I studied lots about... Like I've learned about the phases of the moon, so I know that it's the moon, for a fact. Mm -hmm. Actually, you're right. It is the moon. But this is not the familiar face of the moon that we see every day. Let's say tonight, you know, if you come out, you look at the moon. This is something you would see. Okay, thank you. So this is on the left, on, on the right-hand side, is the face of the moon that we typically see. And you can see it's had a lot less crater than the other image. The other image on the left that I show you, actually it's the same image of the moon, but from the far side of the moon. Actually, it is very interesting to say that, you know, the moon is special because while during its orbit around the Earth, it always faces one side to the Earth. It, so if we're looking from the Earth to the moon, we could never see, be able to see the, the back side of the moon. The only way to be able to see the backside of the moon is to send a spacecraft, you know, to launch it into space, launch it into lunar orbit, to go around the moon and take a picture from that side. Otherwise, from us, we could never see. So now, if you compare the two pictures, you will see a big difference. Now, another question. You see a lot of crater, right? Yes, definitely. But 
the question is why there are so many craters on the far side of the moon compared to the near side of the moon? Anyone can uh, give me an answer for this question? Please. Because uh, when we think about it, the moon is tightly locked to the Earth. So basically, the uh, the side that's facing to the Earth, asteroids will be blocked by the Earth from that side. But on the other side, there's no blockage, so they will freely fall on the other side of the moon. That, that's, that's a very correct question. So indeed, you know, on the near side of the moon, actually, it has to be thankful to, to, be thankful to the Earth, right? Because, you know, somehow the Earth has to block a lot of asteroids impact on the moon. And this also tells us that in space, is it empty? Actually, in space, there's a lot of asteroids, a lot of meteoroids, a lot of asteroids, a lot of rocks moving around. And without an atmosphere to protect it, like, you know, the Earth, this is what happened, you know, to the moon from the far side. Uh, we don't have much time. Let's try to speed up. Uh, this is the future, you know, uh, human plan for, you know, a lunar base on the moon. And hopefully, yeah, eventually, you would be a part of that in the future. Let's talk about climate change. You know, what can we do? Let's look at this animation. It's a very fresh you know, hurricane. It just happened just a few weeks ago in the United States. Hurricane Helen. If you remember about that, if you watch the news, you could see that you know this hurricane is a is a very powerful one, with the wind you know wind speed up to over two hundred kilometers per second, and it causes a lot of damage to the United States. Imagine the U.S. is one of the strongest country in the world, right? They have all kind of technology, all kind of things to protect their citizens. But look at the damage, over 200 fatality. A lot of people was unfortunately lost their life. And then the storm, it caused a huge damage to the infrastructure. And imagine all of this already. So now we could use all of the picture that we are looking at. It's thanks to, you know, space technology, thanks to all the camera, all the, the instrument on board the satellite that could help us to monitor the storm, you know, uh, 24 by 7. It had to predict uh, and have to reduce you know, the impact. But as you can see, look at the damage. There's still a lot more that has to be done. Next, this is uh, another problem. I mean, not in for the UAE, but to many other countries, you know, like if you look at, you know, India, the uh, Africa, China, you know, many other in Brazil, South, South America. This is the uh, World War Global, you know, wildfire monitoring. In country when there is a lot of forest, wildfire, you know, forest fire is a big problem. Because, you know, when it happened, it could easily spread, you know, from just a small fire. It could spread quickly and it destroy a lot of trees, you know, it caused a lot of damage. And, and one of the applications of space is using satellite. We could have to, um, to, do the to early detect you know uh, forest fire and you know inform the authority to come and uh, deal with the problem early on. So think of you know a satellite space technology as our humans' eyes on the sky. We have something on the sky to keep monitoring the entire planet so that we can act quickly. Next, uh, this is another you know uh, application of uh, satellite technology to have to monitor the changes of the surface of the Earth over the year. Uh, as you can see, nowadays, because of climate change, the sea water is rising, right? The temperature is increasing. And by the way, this is the image of Dubai. You can see how, how quickly you know, Dubai evolved you know, from the desert you know, until the, you know, uh, the city that uh, we have nowadays. Um, and because of human activity and because of a lot of other things, the there's a global warming, you know, the entire Earth is, is getting more and more warmer. So this creates a problem because as the Earth warms, the ice on the, uh, you know, uh, polar ice will start melting. You can look at the video. Um, so satellite technology provides an opportunity for us to monitor the changes and have to predict and try to come up with solutions to prevent the damage, you know, to uh, our infrastructure. Uh, so, one more thing, climate change is not about you know, all of the bad things, all of the negative things. Uh, some of the scientists, I would like to bring a, a very a positive way of thinking, you know, from scientists in Japan. 
So now we know that, okay, there is climate change, okay, the sea water is rising because the ice start melting, right? However, okay. looking from the bright side, it brings up a new opportunity. Now let's look at Japan as an example. From Japan, they need to do shipping, you know, they need to do a lot of, you know, uh, commodity shipping, trading with, you know, let's say Europe, okay, they need to send a shipping container containing you know, a lot of cars or products, okay, to be shipping with Europe. Now the question is, what is the best way to go from Japan to Europe and by now, if you look at, you take the long route, you can go from Europe across the coast of uh, Africa, going back to the Indian Ocean and go back to Tokyo. This is a very long way. It takes like 15,000 nautical miles. The shorter way would be going through the Mediterranean Sea and going through the Suez Canal in Egypt. And that's why it's very important, right? And then going from there, going through the Red Sea, and then going uh, again to Indian Ocean. That's save us like 4,000 nautical miles, make the trip shorter and save a lot of fuel. Now, it is the shortest way, uh, thanks to the global warming. So recently, the ice from the uh, you know Arctic Sea, from the Northern Sea, start melting. So which make it possible for the ship to travel to the uh, Arctic Ocean. So now, but it is a very challenging environment, you know, with a lot of icebergs start moving around. And that's why uh, Japanese scientists, they propose to use you know, space technology to develop, you know, a specialized, you know, satellite um, focusing on monitoring the movement of ice, iceberg on the Arctic Ocean. And that could have, you know, ship to go through that, to navigate through that, uh, um, you know, uh, environment in order to make it a shorter way to, to Japan. Right, since we don't have much time and I, I think that maybe we will need, you know, another session as well, but uh, for now, let's try to finish the my presentation with the some information about the UAE space program. Actually, it has a very long history. It started back then in the mid, you know, 70s of the previous century when the Apollo astronaut, you know, from the Apollo program who went to the moon, after the trip to the moon, they came back and they visited the UAE and they met with Sheikh Zayed you know, at that time. At that time, the UAE was just a very young country, if you remember, just which was just founded in 1971. But then Sheikh Zayed already showed his interest in, in the space program. And then he really believed that in the future generation, um, you know, the UAE could be able to, to play a part in the, uh, you know, exploration of space. And then, uh, just you know, uh, like ten years back, you know, the UAE Space Agency was founded, uh, and then it started a lot of amazing uh, program. For example, I'm talking about the Emirates Mars mission. This is the first spacecraft from an Arab country, you know, to go into orbit around Mars, the red planet, and its mission is to study, you know, the atmospheric about the, uh, you know, all the, the composition of the atmosphere of the red planet. It would help for future, you know, human exploration of Mars. Also, another in, uh, interesting mission is the Rashid rover. This is the lunar rover. The mission is to study the surface of uh, the moon. And then Rashid rover 1 was developed at the uh, Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center, and it was launched to the moon like over a year ago. Unfortunately, the mission uh, exploded because of the carrier rocket, you know, fail during the landing on the moon. But did we, did we stop? Did we give up? No. Immediately, you know, we started on the development of the second uh, rover and we will try again. Hopefully next year, Rashid Rover 2 would be launched and carry on the mission to explore the moon. The UAE also had a very, you know, um, uh, um, exciting, you know, human uh, space program where it sent, you know, two astronauts, if you remember, you know, the first astronaut, Hazar al-Mansuri, he went to the International Space Station back in 2019, and he had a short stay there. And then two years back, you know, uh, the second astronaut, Sultan al-Niadi, he spent and he stayed in the space station for a long duration, for six months. And nowadays, the UAE is expanding its astronaut uh, uh, you know, program with the two new astronauts, including the first female astronaut. And my word to all of the, uh, you know, the uh, female student right there, you know, it's your your chance, you know, uh, 
work hard, you know, uh, keep your dream and then, um, you know, uh, ne- uh, learn, try to learn something new a day and never give up your dream. And someday, you know, uh, you would be able to achieve your uh, dream. Um, last but not least, this is the big, you know, future for the uh, Mars project 2021-2017, uh, where we would like to build, you know, a, space, a, a city on Mars. And all of that would not be done without, you know, international collaboration. And the UAE have a very good collaboration with many other countries in the world. It's all about team working. Finally, that's it. I finished my presentation and um, I think we have uh, been with the time for some Q&A. Any questions?